The conflict between Belisarius and Narses in 538 and 539 had given the Ostrogoths some breathing room, but Vitiges knew that he was still in some trouble. He expected a Roman army to be moving on Ravenna sooner rather than later, so he attempted to forge an alliance with the Lombards. When this offer was rejected, Vitiges called a council of Ostrogothic elders together to try to figure something out. The men at this council batted around any idea they could think of to try to save their kingdom, and eventually came to a brilliant conclusion. They did not need to stop Justinian's army on a battlefield in Italy. What they really needed was for Justinian to pull his army out of Italy. And the best way to do that was to awaken Constantinople's old enemy in the east, the Sasanian Empire. Constantinople and Tessaphon had been at peace since 532, and this was the only reason that Justinian had the resources available to spend the 530s waging war in the west. If that peace were to be broken, Justinian would have to pull men out of Italy to defend his eastern border, and this could give the Ostrogoths a chance to drive the Romans back. Getting envoys through Roman territory would not be easy. Vitiges commissioned two priests from northern Italy, possibly Arian Christians, to make the treacherous journey. One priest posed as a bishop, the other as his attendant, and they were off. It would take some time to make the trek, and events in Italy progressed while they moved. Belisarius, now back in full command of the campaign, sent Cyprian and Justinus to Viazole, while Martinus was tasked with heading north to cut Uriah's off from Ravenna. Belisarius himself moved towards Oximum, as he had planned to do months prior. Both Oximum and Fiazole were well defended, and the Romans would have difficulty breaching the walls in both cities. The enemies in both places would need to be starved out, with sieges beginning in the spring of 539. Procopius was with Belisarius at Oximum, and he provides a lot of detail on the numerous raids that took place throughout the siege. As the siege progressed and the city's supplies started to dwindle, the Ostrogoths began to send pleas up to Ravenna by bribing a Roman guard named Burkentius to run the messages up to Vitiges for them. They were able to get numerous messages through, before the Romans were able to capture an Ostrogothic prisoner who revealed what was happening. Burkentius was then burned alive in front of the city's walls, in full view of the Ostrogothic defenders. But those defenders continued to hold out, despite their minimal supplies, which frustrated Belisarius greatly. The siege up in Fiazule was similarly slow. While the siege progressed, Uriah attempted to move his army southwards across the Po to relieve the city. He crossed the river and made camp about seven miles from the Roman army under Martinus. He didn't want to attack until the time was right fearing that a major defeat would be disastrous to the Ostrogothic war effort. Martinus's objective was to keep Uriah's from Ravenna, which was accomplished if Uriah's was just sitting there waiting to make a move on Fiazole, so he didn't need to attack either. The two armies sat a few miles apart, waiting for the other to make the first move. But that first move was not made by either the Ostrogoths or the Romans. It was made by the Franks. Theudebert had advanced a large army through the Alps and was quickly approaching the Ostrogothic camp. The Franks, well, the Burgundians under Frankish orders, had allied with the Ostrogoths during the Siege of Mediolanum so it looked like Uriah's was getting some pretty significant reinforcements. 
that could help tip the scales in his favor and... Wait, what? Deutibert, as it turns out, was not there to help the Ostrogoths. He was there to run them off. Uriah's army was unprepared for the attack and was routed. Many fled straight past the Roman camp, fleeing towards Ravenna. The Romans were unprepared for this and thought that Belisarius had somehow looped around and routed the Ostrogothic camp. So they moved ahead to join in the attack, not aware that the Franks had driven the enemy off and were now apparently on their side. A Roman-Frankish alliance would have been disastrous for Vitiges and... Wait, what? The Franks then launched an attack on the Romans as well, scattering their force. Many Romans fled to Fiazole, while others ran towards Oximum. By routing both armies, the Franks had made their presence felt, and their intentions were now crystal clear. They weren't backing the Romans or the Ostrogoths. They were looking to expand their own borders. It looked like the Franks might be a force in Italy for some time to come, except for one thing. Armies need to be fed. The Franks didn't have a proper supply line in place, so the army was left to fend for itself in northern Italy. They raided what remained of the Ostrogothic and Roman camps, and then ransacked towns and villages in the vicinity to find supplies. This, of course, worked out terribly. Dysentery soon began to spread through the Frankish army, and nearly a third of the undersupplied men perished. When Belisarius heard of the Frankish invasion, he sent a letter to Theudibert, threatening him with Justinian's wrath. Theudibert was stuck with a sick and starving army when he received Belisarius' letter and decided to cut his losses and retreat back across the Alps. The Franks were gone, for now, but the effects of a third army plundering northern Italy would be felt for some time. Meanwhile, the two sieges were still ongoing and Fiazole was running out of supplies. With Uriah's army scattered by Theudibert and Vitiges unable to muster relief from Ravenna, the city was forced to surrender in the fall of 539. This freed up the men to reinforce Belisarius at Oximum. There, the Ostrogoths were still clinging to hope. Vitiges had promised them help in one of his messages through Bercentius, but that help would never arrive. With another Roman army coming, there was just no way out. So Belisarius offered the defenders of the city a deal. If they surrendered, they would be allowed to keep half their property and would be granted full citizenship in the Roman Empire. This deal was the best they were going to get, and the garrison surrendered in December of 539. The road to Ravenna was now completely open for Belisarius. He moved towards the Ostrogothic capital and began a siege there in either very late 539 or early in 540. Vitiges was trapped. Uriah's attempted to send a grain shipment down the Po to Ravenna, but it was intercepted by the Romans. Inside the city, a fire destroyed a warehouse filled with the grain supply. Procopius says that it may have been struck by lightning, but also gives two other possible causes for the fire. It was either set ablaze by a guard who had been bribed by the Romans, or it was done on the order of Montesentha, the daughter of Amalasantha, who had been forced to marry Vitiges back in 537. Uriah's then attempted to muster a relief force, but this failed when Roman units began terrorizing towns in Liguria. 
Urias's soldiers insisted on returning home to save their families from this onslaught. So there was no one coming to Vitigiz's aid. But it wasn't all good news for the Romans. The Ostrogothic envoys had made it to Tessaphon, and the Sasanians had started saber-rattling. Justinian needed the war in Italy to end, and he needed it to end yesterday. He was now prepared to cut a deal. He offered to give Vitigis the lands north of the Po, while holding the rest of Italy and Sicily for his empire. This deal would not only end the war in the west, but it would create an Ostrogothic buffer state between the Romans and the Franks, who had shown that they were ready to expand southward if presented with an opportunity. Vitigis was more than happy to make this agreement. It really was the best he could hope for at this point. There was only one obstacle to overcome, and it was, surprisingly, Belisarius. He had fought tooth and nail for five long years to bring Italy under Roman control. He had suffered through the siege of Rome, dealt with insubordination, and resisted challenges to his authority, but he had pulled through and was now on the brink of bringing the entire Italian peninsula back into the hands of the Roman Empire. He was so close to total victory, but felt Justinian was letting the enemy off the hook. He was so angry that he refused to sign the deal unless ordered to by the Emperor. The Ostrogoths, in turn, refused to sign if Belisarius would not sign. They feared that he was planning some sort of trick, and they weren't going to drop their guard. The Ostrogothic nobility began to fear that the kingdom would fall completely, allowing Justinian to ship them off to the east to fight the war that they themselves had helped instigate. But if they took the peace deal, then Vitiges would remain on the throne and they weren't too keen on that idea either. The kingdom had collapsed under his rule. He was not the guy for the future. So they didn't want to be ruled by Justinian, and they didn't want to be ruled by Vitiges, but maybe there was a third option. After all, a man they greatly respected was camped right outside the walls of their capital city. Maybe there was a way to work with him directly. So the nobles sent secret envoys to Belisarius and made a very compelling offer. They would surrender their territory directly to Belisarius, and he would then rule over Italy. But in doing so, he wouldn't just be replacing Vitigis. This would instead mark a return to the old order, as in the 5th century order. Justinian would keep his Roman Empire in the east, but Italy would once again be the heart of the Roman Empire in the west, and Belisarius would be the new western Roman Emperor. This offer must have been very tempting for Belisarius. It was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that he had earned with his years of hard work and his talent. But Belisarius had taken oaths of loyalty to Justinian, and he took that seriously. It appeared that the only real hurdle for Belisarius was his own moral compass. He responded positively to the offer in order to bring the negotiations out into the open. When the Ostrogothic envoys returned to discuss the deal formally, they made what Procopius calls vague statements regarding the surrender, while attempting to get reassurances from Belisarius that the deal would be accepted. Belisarius pledged that 
if allowed to enter Ravenna, his army would not attack or punish the Ostrogoths. But he did not make any promises about accepting the crown, saying only that he would accept that in front of Vitiges himself. This was enough for the envoys though, because, I mean really, who turns this down? Back inside Ravenna's walls, Vitiges had, by now, heard that the nobility was making this offer to Belisarius, and he supported it wholeheartedly. But also, what choice did he have? He wasn't in a position to fight, and if he took the deal with Justinian, it seemed pretty clear that the nobility would try to replace him anyway. It's not like he was going to get out of this in a good spot. It looked like everyone was on board, and everything seemed to be falling into place for the end of the war. At this point, Belisarius took steps to ensure that his victory would not be tainted by the men he didn't trust. Remember the men who had sided with Narses during the power struggle of 538 and 539? John, Aradius, the other Narses, and Justinus? They were sent far away from the capital, and ordered to station themselves in various towns and cities across Italy. Belisarius also sent Bessus away from Ravenna. Bessus appears to have been neutral in the power struggle, but that was still enough for Belisarius to distrust him at this point. This was going to be Belisarius's crowning moment. The men who had made his life hell weren't going to be allowed anywhere near this. Belisarius ordered a green ship to enter Ravenna's port and then prepared to accept the enemy's capital. Belisarius entered Ravenna triumphantly in May of 540. He took Vitiges as a prisoner, but treated him well. The former king was sent to Constantinople, where Justinian would give him patrician status. Belisarius then gathered the money from the Ostrogothic treasury and... Wait, what? Belisarius was sending the treasury to the east? Why would he do that if he planned to rule from Ravenna? The Ostrogoths were puzzled, but quickly realized that they had been duped. Belisarius never intended to rule in the West. His loyalty to Justinian was just too strong. He had feigned acceptance of their offer solely to take possession of Ravenna and the entire kingdom along with it. He soon prepared to return to Constantinople himself. There was not going to be a new Western Empire. Justinian would have the whole thing. The Ostrogoths, obviously, didn't like this one bit. They felt betrayed by Belisarius, who they had thought was an honorable man. It could not have been easy for them to see the great general sail away from Italy in the summer of 540, knowing that they'd been had. This ended the first stage of the Gothic War, with Belisarius triumphantly heading back to the eastern capital. But we're far from done with the whole conflict. The Ostrogoths had no interest in being ruled from Constantinople, and they would fight like hell to take their territory back. But there was no way for Belisarius to know what would happen in the future. For now, he was on top of the world. This was the peak of his career. He would have more campaigns and more victories, but he would never reach the heights that he reached right here in 540. I wonder what it must have been like for him to sail back to Constantinople and reflect on all that he had accomplished over the course of the 530s. When he first set sail in mid-533, the West looked like this. But now, thanks to him, it looks like this. 
And that was an incredible accomplishment. Thank you.